Well, good morning. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we are going through our summer sermon series, uh, looking at different topics or different heroes or different stories every single week. And we're calling it our summer playlist. Today, I want to talk to you about a biblical hero. Now, when you think of a hero, you're probably inclined to think of strength, right? Or great intellect or charisma or beauty or charm or height or maybe even enormous wealth or maybe just a personal drive for justice. Today we're going to look at a biblical hero, but this hero is none of those things. He, he lived in a time that was idolatrous, the economy was bad, the Bible says that people did whatever they wanted, and, and in a way we could probably compare those times with the times that we live in. This hero started off quiet, as a, as a peaceful farmer who was just hiding away, but he was transformed into a great warrior in a very unusual way. He was transformed when he experienced a personal calling by God. Today, we're going to talk about Gideon. I think all of us have a, a circle of influence, and that circle is different for every single person. I think it's large for some, small for others. Some people may never even leave the small town where they grew up, Others may move halfway around the world and become titans of industry. And the Bible has many of these stories of people that impacted thousands and people who maybe only impacted one or two. And we read these stories in the Bible as being fantastical, otherworldly. And we think, I could never be used like that. We think we, ne we couldn't ever make a difference like that, that we could never be used by God like that. But is that really true? I don't think so. I think that each of us is a minister. I think each one of us can be used by God. I think God isn't as concerned about your height or size or sphere of influence. He's not as concerned with how famous you are. He only cares that you follow him and that you trust him. I believe God calls each of us, wherever we are, to reach and to lead and to love the world around us. You don't have to change your circle of influence. You don't have to broaden it. You just have to be faithful, faithful with what you've been given. And then who knows? God may trust you enough to give you greater impact later in life. You know, once after teaching a parable, Jesus said the one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you, who have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You know, despite what most people think, Jesus was not trying to teach them about money or investing. This was a parable that Jesus taught to talk about trust and obedience. Perhaps you remember uh, singing a song in church a long time ago, trust and obey for there's no other way. The book of Hebrews has a list of these men and women who trusted and obeyed. It says, what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. Today we're going to talk about the very first name on that list. And that's Gideon. I think that many of us will certainly be able to identify with Gideon, probably in more ways than one. 
Because before Gideon was great, he had to get past some obstacles. And they're not the obstacles that you're probably expecting. Now, God was calling Gideon to something great, but Gideon couldn't get past himself. More specifically, he couldn't get past the lies that he told himself. It's those shortfalls and those shortcomings that we tell ourselves and we believe about ourselves. That's what truly gets in our way, I think, from accomplishing God's plans. The story of Gideon is told in the book of Judges. It's going to be in chapter 6. Uh, if you're new to looking things up in the Bible, the book of Judges is seventh from the front. And no, Judges is not a book about judging others. <laughs> Before Israel had a king, uh, it had a series of tribal leaders called Judges. God used those leaders, who were both men and women, to save the Israelites from their enemies and lead them back to him. But Gideon is not like the other judges. You know, when you think of Samson, you think of a guy who was tall and strong and who knew how to fight. He was a warrior. Uh, when you think of Deborah, she was a judge. She was a strong leader. She was also a very powerful preacher. Gideon is neither of those things. Gideon is the underdog story. He's the unlikely hero. He's more of a person I can identify with. He, I'm, I'm five foot five. I'm not very athletic. Uh, at recess, I used to read books. When I was a kid, I read Spider-Man comics because Spider-Man was actually a teenager and he wore glasses. He got picked on. He didn't get the girl. His life was filled with heartbreak and failure. And as I got older uh, and I maybe got a little bit into sports, uh, my favorite football team was the Miami Dolphins and my favorite baseball team was the Chicago Cubs because, again, I like an underdog story. Judges chapter 6, verse 1 says, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops... The Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or onks or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted. So that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Chapter 6 begins by telling you that God's people are disconnected right now from God. Their enemies have taken over, and their, their enemies are everywhere. The Bible says the Midianites were like locusts. They're consuming all the resources. And the Israelites are so scared that they're literally hiding out in mountain cliffs. So the dilemma is, God's people are in trouble, so God needs to save them. And typically, the way God chooses to do his work is through us, through people, right? And so in this story, it's going to happen through Gideon. So God picks Gideon. You, you and I, we would not have picked Gideon. He, he would not have been our first choice. I think you and I would have picked somebody who was strong and attractive and courageous and tall. Gideon is none of those things. Verse 11 says, Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. What do we see Gideon doing? Well, he's trying to hide resources from the Midianites. He's probably hiding out himself. He's throwing grain up in the air with a wooden pitchfork. And the usable parts fall back down and the bad stuff blows away. And he's doing it all inside of a building. So uh, this is not a good place for someone who has allergies, right? And God speaks to him and he calls him, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon looks around and goes, who are you talking to? <laughs> Me? This guy threshing wheat? Yes, Gideon. Gideon has no clue that his story is going to be the longest 
judge's story in the book of Judges, or that he would be called the greatest judge of all of Israel. Because listen to how Gideon responds to God. Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Okay, first of all, no. (laughs) Who talks to God like this? Very few people ever get the chance to have a visit from God or an angel in the Bible. Very, very few people. You could literally count them on your hands, right? And and this is how you respond. This is how your mother raised you. Don't you dare talk to God like that. Sarcasm, bitterness, casting blame. But Gideon has lost his faith in God. Gideon feels like God hasn't kept his promises. God hasn't come through for them. And this is the first lie that we tell ourselves. My faith is not enough. My faith is not enough. You know, the pastor preaches that God is with you. God will protect you. God will save you. God will look out for you. And you're thinking there in the pew, sitting there by yourself, thinking, really? (laughs) Oh, really? Well, then how come my mom died? How come I lost my job? How come I got sick? God can change my life. God, can I make my life better? No, I'm, I'm better off without God. We have fears about our finances, fears about our future, fears about our health. We fear about violence that's going on around the world. We fear corruption in our government. And we doubt that God's kingdom is coming, that God's will is being done. And the first lie we tell ourselves is, you know what? My faith is fine but it's strong enough for the heavy lifting. You know, if you want to do something right, I'd have to do it myself. And right now, all Gideon sees are his enemies, and they're everywhere. And they show no signs of leaving. So Gideon doesn't have the faith that God will do the things that he promised. So how does God respond? The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, And save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? Does God care that Gideon doesn't have faith? Nope. God says, yeah, yeah, that's nice. Go anyway. My family just got back from Disney World a couple weeks ago. Do you think my two boys would have gone on as many roller coasters if my wife and I hadn't gone with them? No, of course not. So why did they ride the roller coasters? Because we went with them, because we walked beside them, we encouraged them, we told them they could do it. Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Psalm 37 says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. If you think your faith is not enough, you are right. It's not. That's why God goes with you. You think you're not enough. You're right. You're not. But God is, and he goes with you. So Gideon is convinced, right? That's all it took. He's convinced. Nope. (laughs) Look at his next excuse. He said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. What's the second lie we tell ourselves? I'm not enough, right? My faith is not enough. I am not good enough. And he says, you know, this is, this is me. This is my family. I'm from Manasseh. Why is Manasseh the weakest clan? Why does Gideon not believe in his family or in his tribe? A couple of reasons. First, the namesake of the tribe, Manasseh, he was an idolater. He turned away from God and he worshiped every other pagan god. Manasseh was guilty of immorality. He practiced every inconceivable evil and perversion. He devoted himself to witchcraft. He was a murderer. So that's not good. (laughs) 
And then secondly, uh, when Joshua was going in to claim the promised land, everyone had to cross the Jordan River. But when the tribe of Manasseh got there, half of their tribe said, uh, you guys uh, go on ahead. We're going to stay right here because this is really good land. We're going we're gonna to raise our sheep here. So half of the tribe stayed behind. So when God asks you to lead the army and you look around and you're like, me? Who am I? I I'm hiding out in a threshing floor. I'm, I'm doing farm work. And, and I don't come from a warrior clan. My, my people are not fighters. Gideon doesn't believe that God will deliver on his promises. And Gideon doesn't believe in himself. He doesn't believe that he has what it takes. Tell me something. How many times have you ever sensed God calling you to do something and then you talked yourself out of it? Before you ever talked to your pastor about it, before you ever even prayed about it, you just said, I can't do that. I wouldn't know what to say. I wouldn't know what to do. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too damaged. My family is too broken. I'm unusable. How many times have you faced a problem or an obstacle in your life and you just met it, not with courage, but with fear? You looked at your circumstances, you looked at your resources, and you said, no. I'm done. I'm finished. I need to go away and I'll just hide for a little while. Today, I think there's a lot of people who are facing difficulties. This year uh, probably brought challenges to every single one of us. And it'd be easy to look at ourselves, to look at our faith like Gideon and say that we're helpless or hopeless. Listen to the answer that God gives. The Lord said to him, but I will be with you, and you will strike the Midianites as one man. See, but you're forgetting one thing, Gideon. You're not going by yourself. You're not going with your tribe. You're not going with your past. God smashes Gideon's lie, and he says, I'm going with you. Plus, where you've come from, what you've done, that does not determine your future. You think your past is a weakness or that you've, you've never been successful in the past so you think that you won't be successful in the future? Have you ever seen uh, that list about Abraham Lincoln? You ever seen that list of failures about Abraham Lincoln? Abraham Lincoln, right? One of the greatest, most famous presidents. He has a list of failures. Lost his job in 1832. He was defeated for state legislature in 1832. He failed in business in 1833. He was then elected to state legislature in 1834. Then his sweetheart died in 1835. He had a nervous breakdown in 1836. He was defeated for speaker in 1838, defeated for nomination for Congress in 1843, finally elected to Congress in 1846, lost his renomination in 1848, rejected for land officer in 1849, defeated for the U.S. Senate in 1854, defeated for nomination for vice president in 1856, again defeated for the U.S. Senate in 1858, and elected president in 1860. That's a lot of failure before he was successful. Your past does not determine your future. We need to understand that the Lord God has all power, all authority, in the entire universe, there is nothing and no one else like him. Everything else is under his power. Everything in the world is under his authority because he created all things. No one can stand against him. And when God wins, he wins. So God, Gideon's telling lies to himself. And God's working past those excuses. So this is where the story gets really interesting. God has told Gideon, that he, son of Joash, would lead the Israelite army to great victory over the Midianites. So Gideon calls for all the men who can fight. And he looks over a vast army of 32,000 men. And he says, this could be pretty cool. We could do this. 
And then in chapter 7, verse 2, the Lord says to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. So before even Gideon has a chance, God says, ah, da, 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 da. Not so fast, Gideon. You've got way too many men. Too many men? How, how can I have too many men? I mean, sure, if, you know, if you had 60 men and they were all trying to squeeze themselves into a lifeboat that could only hold 50, then yeah, you have too many. But if you're going into battle, <laughs> you can never have too many men, especially if you're already outnumbered. Right now, even with 32,000 men, Gideon is still outnumbered four to one. God thinks he has too many men. You see, God wanted this to be a God thing. Gideon was hoping this would be a Gideon thing. And, and you really can't blame Gideon for that. But God said, you have too many warriors because if you win, then everyone's going to think that you guys did it all by yourselves. So, so here's what I want you to do, Gideon. I'm going to go to your army and just say, hey, if any of you guys are scared, you can go home. Just go home. So Gideon gets up there and he makes the announcement and 22,000 soldiers leave. 22,000 gone, just like that. Leaving Gideon with 10,000. Now he only has 10,000. And just as Gideon is getting his head wrapped around that, God looks over there and says, uh, nah, you still have too many. Too many? Still too many? And, and so God tells the, the Gideon to direct the men to go down to the water and for them to all get something to drink. And maybe there'll be those who get down on all fours and they'll stick their face right in the water and drink the water just like a dog. Or there'll be men who get down on one knee and scoop the water into their hands and drink it from their hands. Only 300 men drank from their cupped hands. And God said, I'll wait to keep those and you can send the rest home. 300. And there he is, Gideon and his 300 men. And the only thing that they've got going for them right now is that they know how to drink water politely. So what are you going to do? Now, at this point, I'm not sure that Gideon was all that convinced of this plan. Gideon said, how is 300 going to face off against 32,000? And this leads to the third lie we tell ourselves. I don't have enough. I don't have the resources to do what you're asking. What don't you have enough of? Time. We're all busy. I know. Money. Vision. Clarity. You know, a few weeks ago we read a story where the disciples were complaining that they didn't have enough bread. Right after they saw Jesus make bread out of thin air. I remember riding my bike to the five and dime and I would count the coins in my pocket to see if I could afford a candy bar, one candy bar, and, and which candy bar I could afford. Now as an adult who has a bank account and a salary, the reality is I could go back to that, fa that same five and dime and I could buy all the candy bars if I wanted to. And see, it's the same with God. It's when I'm looking at my own plan and my own coins in my pocket and I'm looking at what needs to be done and I'm thinking, I don't, I don't have enough. I can't do this. All the while, the one who has all the resources is right behind me. And so just to put Gideon and his 300 men at ease, God said, you, you can do it. You can do it. And if you don't believe me, I want you to go down to the enemy camp and I want you to listen to what they're saying. So that's what Gideon did. He took one of his leaders with him and they snuck over to the Midianite camp and they eavesdropped in on the conversation that was going on around the enemy campfire. 
So Gideon overheard two guys talking, and the first guy said, hey, I had the strangest dream last night. I dreamt that a loaf of barley bread rolled down the hill right into the camp, and it squashed one of our tents. And the second guy said, wow, your, your dream could only mean one thing, that Gideon and his men are going to kill us. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's the interpretation you would have come up with, but it worked for Gideon, and he went back and he told his troops. Gideon then took his 300 men and he divided them into three teams. It's 100, 100 on each team, right? 100 in, in, in each group. I, I went to college. And he gave each soldier a horn and a clay jar and uh, a torch, okay? And just around midnight, they all surrounded the Midianite camp and on signal, they all blew their horns and they took their clay jars and they broke them all at once and revealed their torches. The Midianites saw that and just panicked. The Israelites blew their horns again and the Bible says that there was so much confusion in the enemy camp that the men actually woke up and started to fight each other. And any of the soldiers that didn't fight each other, the rest ran away confused. You know, another one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves is that God only uses special people. And, and like all lies, this one's kind of based on a, a half-truth. God does only use special people. But God doesn't use them because they're special. They're special because God used them. 1 Peter 2 says, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You understand that you're special, don't you? You are special enough that God was willing to send his very own son to die for you. Because you are so special, Jesus Christ came to earth. He lived 33 years. He died on a cross. He was laid in a borrowed tomb, and three days later he rose from the dead. Willingly, he did that. Not because he had to, but because you are that special. And, and, and special has nothing to do with how you look or what you can do or how smart you are. Special has everything to do with the fact that you were created as a unique individual and you were created by the master of the universe. That same God who painted rainbows across the sky, the same God who paints the morning sunrise and the evening sunset, the same God who scooped out the Grand Canyon with his fingers, the same God who molded the, Maki, the Rocky Mountains with his hands and threw the Milky Way into the midnight sky, that same God created you. You know, as parents, we want our children to do the very best they can. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we can't do the very best for them. God looks down at his children and he wants us to be the very best that we can, to do the very best that we can, but we have to do it. And I'm sure we must frustrate God so much. And if God can be frustrated when he looks down, knowing completely well that we are capable of doing it, and we just aren't doing it, I mean, look through the Bible. Look at the people that, that God used. Gideon was a farmer. Moses, David, they were shepherds. Peter was a fisherman. Matthew was a tax collector. He was a tax collector. And God used them all. There wasn't one superstar in that entire bunch. And I know we always give Gideon grief because he questioned God, but that didn't make him disobedient. You ever get the impression from some preachers that, that God never wants you to question? He never wants you to think? He just wants you to jump when spoken to? That's not true. God didn't make us a bunch of brain-dead zombies that just had no ability to reason or an ability to think or an ability to question. God gave you all those things. The Bible is full of people who doubted. The Bible is full of people who ask questions. Abraham said, how can I be the father of a nation when I don't have any kids? 
Moses said, how can I speak to Pharaoh when I don't speak very well? Plus, if you read through the Psalms, you see that David was always asking God, who, what, where, when, why? Mary said, how can I have a son? I'm not married. Even Jesus, when he hung on the cross, said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Listen, especially if you're new to all of this, church is not about coming in and checking your brain at the door. It's not about abandoning reason. It's not about abandoning all your questions and just mindlessly going along with things. Now, that doesn't mean that we'll always understand God or that we'll understand his answers. I mean, it's even possible that you might not agree with God. That's why a lot of this is about faith and trust. At the end of all of this, Gideon had to trust. He had to have faith. He had to take his 300 men and trust that God would fulfill his plan. And listen to what happens at the end after there is victory. Judges 8 says, Then the Israelites said to Gideon, Be our ruler. You and your son and your grandson will be our rulers, for you have rescued us from Midian. Just like that. From a farmer to a king. That's not a bad move. But listen to how Gideon responds. He says, I will not rule over you, nor will my son. The Lord will rule over you. We always got to give credit where credit is due. And that's what God wanted from the very beginning, right? Now, that doesn't mean, of course, you pretend that you had nothing to do with it, but rather you understand where your talents and your resources and your abilities come from. When things go well, Sometimes the temptation is to say, oh, look at all the things that I have done. But it's not what we have done. We are great because God is great. We have to recognize and give credit where credit is due. It's not, it's not what we've done. It's what he has done. It's what God has done. Gideon is a hero of the Bible. And you can be willing to be like Gideon, to allow God to do great things with you, to allow God to do great things through you. But it means having faith in God. It means having faith in yourself, and it means trusting God to use the resources you've been given to do those great things. And it's possible. It's possible for each and every one of us. We are all called by God to do great things and to influence the circle around us, to be an influence and to be a minister to the place where God has placed each of us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this story. Even though it's an Old Testament story, it still is relevant and has meaning for our lives. We thank you for Gideon and the example that he set, that it's possible to doubt. It's possible to have questions and still be used and to still find a way to apply our faith to our lives, to trust and obey. Lord, as we look at our own callings in our own lives, as we look at our own doubts and fears and hesitations, we ask that you would work through those things. Help us to find our way and our direction as we follow you in all things and in every way. Thank you for being our victor. Thank you for being our leader, our encourager. And if you are speaking to us and calling us to anything, Lord, we just pray that you would continue to encourage us, encourage us to break through the lies that we tell ourselves and to listen only to you and to your voice. And we ask all these things in your precious, in your precious son's name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Thanks for being a part of these videos and uh, coming back here every single week. Of course, I want to encourage you to come. 
Come to church. We're here every single Sunday. We have two services. We have one at 9.30. It's our traditional service. We have a choir. They're going to sing all your favorite songs. And we have an 11 o'clock service that's more contemporary. We have a worship team. And at 11 o'clock, we also have a children's program. We have a full youth program. And we have a youth group that meets every single Wednesday. You can follow them on Instagram. Or you can just reach out to their youth director. You can find his email on our website at waldenchurch.com. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.